Hey, can we give the worship team a round of applause and just thank them? Man, they're awesome. Got another drummer in the house. Pastor Jeremy's back there dancing around. You may be seated. Uh, so he's bouncing around. He's trying to outbounce Sean, so I don't know. Uh, and then Paul Farmer, we're going to have to get Paul bouncing in there because now he's the only one that, that doesn't bounce in the drum cage. Uh, but uh, hey, we're, we're excited about today. Uh, my name is Pastor Scott. If you're new here, so glad you're worshiping with us. We're kicking off this series uh, called Three, which you can tell from the big lighted sign behind me. Uh, and uh, it's the first, second, and, and third John. Um, I thought it'd be funny the other day. I saw the, the media team getting, getting the sign made and putting the lights in. I saw them carrying it in when I was driving up. So I sent, Bill, uh, I sent uh, Ben a text and I said, hey, uh, I thought of a new name for the series. Can we just go ahead and change it? Uh, ben didn't think it was that funny, uh, but I thought it was pretty funny because uh, they'd worked all day cutting that thing out and getting it all set. But uh, we're excited uh, to be able to highlight John's letters to the churches there in, in the Ephesus, uh, uh, Colossians church area uh, of, of Asia. He didn't write to a specific church like Paul often did. He wrote to, to different churches that were, that were growing and maturing. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to look at it uh, in 1 John and, and for three weeks, and then 2 and 3 John each have their own week. But we're going to see that throughout the, these books here, as, as these letters, as, as John writes them, he, he only says a few things, and he kind of keeps coming back to them. I, I would imagine if, if he wrote this and turned it in as a paper in, in high school or college, he'd probably get like a D or a D minus because the teacher would say, uh, you just keep saying the same thing over and over again, uh, just trying to fill up some words, uh, trying to get that, you know, 10,000 word mark or whatever it is that they give you. Uh, and he probably wouldn't get a great grade. Uh, but the reality is this, he, he loves to come back to the things that he sees are so important and so valid and so necessary for us as followers of Jesus. So he does this kind of circular thing where he just constantly comes back to love and obedience and, and walking and knowing truth. That, that, that kind of encompasses so much of what he writes in, in his heartbeat. And as he starts off the, uh, the book of 1 John, in the first three verses, he, he's, he's telling us who Jesus is and that he's always been that he's fully God, he's fully eternal, that, and, and that he was indeed on earth for, for a period of time, and John's like, I saw him, I knew him, I walked with him. You can read the, the Gospel of John to even see more about that, because he wrote that one as well. He tells us that Jesus was with the Father, and he lived on earth as a man. And John, he was used by God to show us the heart of Jesus, to show us uh, the, the fullness of, of, of what compelled Jesus to, to love and have compassion and mercy for us, what, what compelled Jesus to go to the cross. We sang the song about he carried our shame. He, he carried it to the cross so we didn't have to, to bear it anymore. And, and John's, he's, he's entreating us to live passionately and purposefully in the truth of, of what our good, good father knows is best for us. So as he writes to us in, in 1 John, in the fourth verse, he kind of sums up the, the true goal of the letter, and he, he tells him, hey, listen to what I'm saying. Do what I say, and your joy will be complete, and so will ours. He's saying, I want your joy to be complete, and your complete joy by walking in truth, it, it makes me as a church leader, as, a, as, as an apostle, as, as one who loves you like my own kids, it makes my joy complete. You see, John wrote this letter I see all three of these to, to a very young church, to a number of young churches, and, and God gives it to us today to show what it truly looks like to live out the Christian life. And if you want to turn to me to, to 1 John chapter 1, I'm going to read a few verses from chapter 1 and a, and a few from chapter 2. And John writes this in, in 1 John 1 verse 5. He says, this is the message we heard from Jesus. And now declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say that we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all 
wickedness. That right there is a powerful verse that we're going to be unpacking in a series that we start in the fall. But we're going to focus on the light today. And then he goes on to, in chapter 2, verse 3. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person's a liar, is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show completely they love him. That is how we know we're living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. You see, in the life of Jesus, we get this personal training lesson for, for how to live right. What Jesus did and what Jesus said. How he loved and how he served. It's so easy when you, when you look at these books here, these letters from John, and, and you read the Gospels to, to see the, the compassionate and passionate heart of Jesus. And then Jesus tells us, everything, when you see me and everything that I'm doing, you're seeing the Father. I'm a mirror image. So who the Father is, I am. Who I am, the Father is. And that's a beautiful picture. That as we see what Jesus does on planet Earth, that's who the Father God is. And then Paul tells us in the, in the book of 2 Corinthians that when we become followers of, of Jesus, when we become believers in God, that God begins this transformational process of making us become like Jesus. And that's exactly what happened to this 20-something-year-old named John, who was a former fisherman. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your written word. I thank you for speaking to, to normal men and giving him your heart, giving him your words for us today that we can live by. That if we, if we walk in it like John says, we're going to be seen as true followers of Jesus. We're going to live in the light. We're going to stand out in a dark world. And we're going to be able to be compassionate and merciful and loving for all around us. So I pray today that that Holy Spirit, as you speak to each of us individually, that we'd simply respond to you and become more like Jesus because of what you share with us and because of what you are doing, Father God. It's nothing we do. It's, it's what you're doing in us. And we are the hope of glory because of it. So we give you this time. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we get going here, I want to I wanna share a little bit about who, who John was. I mentioned that he was a fisherman. He's the son of a fisherman. His brother James, from the Bible there, wrote the book of James. He's a fisherman. He, he was Jesus' best friend. You know, we, we read through the, the gospel stories of Jesus that he had three really close friends, Peter, James, and John. And of those three, John was, was the one that was probably his closest friend when he walked on planet Earth. John was half of the brother duo known as the Sons of Thunder, uh, when, he's, uh, when, when Mark is writing, he said that Jesus liked to call them the Sons of Thunder. That's a pretty cool nickname. Sounds kind of like a wrestling duo, you know, like a WWE or something. But, but it's so cool to not only have that name Sons of Thunder, but then like Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, is the one that names you that. That's pretty cool. But part of why they were named that is because they were a little out there. There was one point where somebody wouldn't let some of the guys stay in their house. And they're like, hey, Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? And Jesus is like, no, no, that's sin. Uh, but, you know, so, so they were, bra he was brash and impetuous at times. He was like this edgy wild stallion, like a, a commercial fisherman also, often is. If you watch The Deadliest Catch, they're a different breed. And he needed to be trained and guided. And so he was by Jesus Christ himself. That's a pretty good trainer and guide. He was the only disciple that wasn't martyred. He actually lived well into his late 90s, maybe even into uh, past 100 years old. He became a loving and compassionate shepherd. That guy that wanted to call on fire from heaven because somebody wouldn't let him do what he wanted becomes this loving, compassionate shepherd to the New Testament church. I mean, just read these letters and the gospel he wrote. This unlearned, unschooled man, as Jesus critics once called him, wrote five books in the New Testament. He knew what it meant to stand out because of the one he believed in. He understood the challenge of being light in dark. It's why we're titling this first sermon in this three series, Stand Out, Light in the Dark. Because that's what John's telling us. He's telling us a number of things. We could probably spend a whole year in this small book. But today we're going to focus on 
being a light in the dark because he understood what that's, what that's all about. In fact, if anyone ever questioned John's loving challenges to, to live out this sometimes difficult life in Christ, to stand out, if anyone ever asked, well, who does he think he is? I think it's good to know Bible and church history to understand where he's coming from. You see, he escaped death a number of times when, when, the, when the leaders uh, of both religion and politics were killing the, the leaders of the church and, and killing all of his friends. He escaped a number of times in a number of different ways. His brother James was the first disciple to be martyred for Jesus, to be put to death. At one point, church history tells us that John was boiled alive in order to deny and, 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 and stop following Jesus. And he refused. So they, they exiled him to this nasty, craggy, rocky prisoner's island called Patmos, where Jesus just happened to visit him and give him the revelation of Jesus Christ that we call the book of Revelation now. So uh, try, try as you want, enemy. God always wins. Amen. You can send him to a rock, and then we get revelation out of it. So John understood a thing or two about facing trials and walking through struggles. And what did this former pill, who was called by Jesus and transformed into a church leader, love to do the most? He loved to talk about Jesus' love over and over and over. He loved to do his best to convince followers of Jesus that they were actual children of the living God and seemingly beg those that he considered his own spiritual kids to live in and out of love. You see, from from John to the writings of Paul to the author of Hebrews, all throughout the, the Old Testament, We see over and over how important it is and was to the Father God to to convince us that we were his kids, that we are his kids, that that he chose and adopted us like like Ben was saying earlier, to remind us of who we are so that we have this inner strength when we're we're called to live out a sometimes challenging life or or to stand out in, in a world that that says, hey, just fit in with all the other mess, or, or hey, just be consumed by this darkness, to, that, that we have this inner strength that we can, we can be a light in, in a dark world. Peter does the same thing. He, he tells us the same thing in, in both books that he writes when he reminds followers of Jesus that, that we are the literal home of God. That's what the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is in the life of a believer. And, and, and Peter's writing in, in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, he's, he's writing about, about being God's chosen, and he's comparing us to, to the temple. And he says this in 1 Peter 2, verse 4, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He, Jesus is where it all started. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. What's more, you're his holy priest. Peter's saying, hey, you're carrying the presence of God. The temple used to be a place where we went and found God. But now you're a walking temple. And you carry that. And as a holy priest, you get to bless and minister to people. He's giving us this huge job description. And then he just writes on down in, in verse 9. You're royal priest, you're a holy nation, you're God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warned you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You see, Peter, he's connecting with the people there. Their their temple meant a lot to him. King David had kind of set it all up and then his son Solomon had it built. And, and, And so as Peter's writing here, he, he's connecting them to what, what that temple meant. It was huge and it was, it was seemingly priceless. It was a huge part of their identity. It was beautiful. And so Peter is telling them and he's telling us today that, that as Jesus' church across the globe, 
were even more impressive. That we, whereas a temple can only be in one place and stand out in that one place and is more seen as, as this big structure and, and beautiful structure, we're walking light. We walk into darkness. We walk into brokenness. A temple can't walk into brokenness unless we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's good news. That's better news than this impressive temple that Solomon built. And it wasn't a wrong thing to build. It was for the time. But the times are better now, at least better for a lost world. We are former dead people. All alone. Looking out for ourselves. We're hurting and we're broken and we're hurtful. And then we're made alive in Jesus Christ. And so we gather together to worship him. We learn and we grow together. We have real life groups where we, where we tear things apart more. And we eat food and, and we grow together as a small caring community. And then we celebrate on Sundays together. And then we reach out to this world around us as a family. As a family we go we go to where the need is and where the lost are and where the broken are and where darkness is. And as we walk into darkness, what happens? It flees, right? Amen. No matter how dark a room is, when you flip on the light switch, darkness is gone. Light always wins. So we're on purpose. We're missional. We're missions-minded wherever we go. We share the gospel in word where we tell our stories and we talk about Jesus and, and indeed where we do Mission Hill Country and stuffing a, a school bus with backpacks and school supplies where we, we go to Dubai across the globe to take the light of Jesus into a dark world where almost everybody is lost. Yeah, and we share with those who are lost and dying, hopeless and hurting, in need of love and grace and and maybe just in need of service. Somebody, can somebody help me? I can't even take care of, of my, my home. I can't, I can't get into my house. I need somebody to build me a ramp. So you know what we do as a church? We build ramps. And it shares the gospel of Jesus. We go into the Boys and Girls Club and we, we take over for a day. They just kind of give it to us and we say, well, if you give it to us, we're going to give them Jesus. And they're like, okay. And so we do. And we will. And all of this, everything that, that Peter is saying here, that he truthfully encourages us with, it's all to show God's goodness towards us and his love for, for the world around him, around us. We, we stand out. We stand out because we were called out of darkness into light, like Peter says. And, and you're either going to stand out for Jesus or blend in with death and destruction and darkness. And if that's you, don't be condemned or shamed today. Just make a decision to, to step out, to stand out. And you don't stand out for yourself. I don't stand out for myself. But because I have the spirit of the living God in me, I can't help but stand out. Because he stands out. Because he shines forth. There's a beautiful story in the Old Testament about, about light standing out in the midst of darkness. It's in 1 Kings Chapter 18, and Elijah, it's the story of Elijah, and there's this wicked king, Ahab, married to a more wicked queen, Jezebel. You got 450 prophets of Baal, and then there's Elijah, the one prophet of God, trying to stand out. I'm going to read it to you, a little bit of it, and, and tell you the story. It's in, it's in 1 Kings 18, starts in, in verse 20. So they're kind of having this confrontation. It says that, Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, darkness, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. And then he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with 450 prophets of Baal to see whose God was really real and all-powerful. They, they decide we're each going to take a bull, we're going we're to chop it up, we're going to put it on the altar, we're going to call on our God to, to incinerate it, and whoever gets burned up, they win. That's kind of the competition. Whoever, whoever gets burned up first, they, they, their God is God. So Elijah tells them to go first, and, and they cried out, and they danced, and they ran around for hours and hours and hours. And then it says, after a full morning of them just running around like crazy... Elijah gets a little Holy Spirit humor in him. And he says, hey, 
call out a little louder, he might be in a deep sleep. Or, or maybe he's in the bathroom. It even says, he, your God could be relieving himself. And, and they're like, okay, we'll cry out louder. They danced and they went crazy. They had like a, a crazy rave going on all the way into the evening with nothing happening. And then Elijah, he calls the, the people of, of Israel over. And it says that, that he repaired the altar that they broke. Isn't that a beautiful picture of God? That he repairs the thing that we break. He's the repairer and the rebuilder and the restorer of things that we mess up. He didn't even make us do it. We can't. So he says, let me. And then Elijah, he takes, he takes 12 stones to represent the 12, nations of, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel to show them who they are. Isn't that like God? They constantly come back to showing us who we are. You're, you're following these wicked gods right now, but you're still my kids, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you that, that you're, my, you're my nation that grew out of this unqualified guy named Jacob, and, and, and God's showing them that. Isn't that just like him, to always be the one to do it all for us? And then Elijah, he takes a bunch of water and he pours it all over the altar and all over the bull. He builds a trench and pours water in it. He was looking for a way to see God glorified in a big, big way the most. And then it says this in, in verse 36. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Prove today that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant. Prove that I've done all this at your command. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, oh, Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. What a beautiful picture. God constantly bringing us back to him. We leave him, we fail him, we sin against him, we, we cover up our light or we turn it off and we, we exist in darkness and he comes to us and for us. And then God totally consumed that altar. And in fact, he consumed the altar of the bad guys too. One man stood out amongst them all by boldly confronting darkness that was running rampant through the nations and even God's own people. It was love shown through power. God was saying, I'm not a wimpy, lovey-dovey God. I'm a loving, powerful God. And I'll consume darkness. And I'll show you that you're my kids. I mean, Elijah even chose to stack the odds against God to display his glory, and God came through. You see, God always displays his glory to show us who he is. But, but he also does it as another way to, to lead us and guide us, to, to bring us back to him and his good and gracious heart. We need him. We cannot do life on our own. Left on our own, we're going to screw it up. I mean, we're just sheep. Sheep are never meant to be in charge of sheep. They're all dumb. And sometimes it's a little like, why do you call me a sheep? And they're dumb. But they're so loved and they're so much in need. They can't do a thing for themselves. The best they can do is fall over and pretend they're more dead than the other sheep so that something would eat the live ones. That's the best the sheep can do. So we need God. He just constantly and lavishly pours out his love on us, his grace to us. He, he tells us in Hebrews that when you need mercy and grace the most, come to me and you'll find it. And he turns us to him or back to him. As we kicked off the, the service today, we sang that song, Awake My Soul. I love that song. It reminds me of, of what King David told his own soul when he's like, why so down? Just, just be lifted up. We said, I was dead. I was gone. I thought I was done. Can anybody relate at one point in their life? You were there. You light up the dawn. When it's dark, you bring the sun. You light up the dawn. You raise me up again, God. The old will burn away and you'll give me newness of life. Amen. Awake my soul. 
And maybe for some of you here, you're like, Scott, I, I love him, I do, I, or I believe in him, I just, I'm struggling and I, I feel like my soul is just dead asleep, that nothing can wake it up. I want to follow him, but I keep falling and failing and messing up. He's made a way for you. It's called repentance. You just turn. You just turn. You just stop walking and you turn. You say, I, I love you. I want to come back. And he says, come on. Amen. He's the God that's on the lookout. He's the God that comes for us. He's the God that makes a way where there is no way. He's the God that brings streams of living water in your dead deserts. He's the God that does it all because he loves you, not because you bother him. So all you have to do to have your soul awakened is say, I want you. I don't want to be dead anymore. I don't want to be gone anymore. I just, I want to live in the, in the fullness of what you have for me. You just make that decision. You just say, Jesus, please. And he's there. And if you've, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus... And you're like, I, I want a, a soul that's awake. I, I want a purpose. I, I want to be called someone's child. I want to have a dad forever. All you do, according to Paul, who was inspired by the spirit of the living God, is say, I believe in you and I choose to follow you. And then he fills in the blanks. He calls you to new life. He gets rid of your old life. He gives you his perfect life that he lived on planet earth. And he says, hey, when I went to the cross... When I, when I bore your sins, when I, when I took the wrath of God, by you saying yes to me now, that all goes into play. He did it. We just happen to say yes at some point in life, and then we get it all. And all you have to do to have a relationship with Jesus today and forever is say, I choose to believe and follow you. And then you are his, and you can never not be God's child. That's good news. Even in our... Turning or returning, whatever it happens to be, it's a story of what God does for us. It's his story. It's how he takes away our stony, stubborn, hard heart, and he gives us this pliable, soft, receptive heart like we read about in Ezekiel 36. His compassion and his mercy for us always stands out. And that's what Jesus did on planet Earth. There's a story in, in John 8 about Jesus and his compassion and mercy standing out with this woman that was caught in adultery. And they're bringing, him to, bringing her to Jesus and they're, and they're basically wanting him to trip himself up or be the bad guy or, or look like a hypocrite. And so Jesus, right there, has compassion and mercy and forgiveness just ooze out of him. And they end up just kind of slinking away all the accusers and, and it's just her and Jesus and he says, hey, where, where are your accusers? And she goes, they're all, they're all gone. And he goes, I'm not going to condemn you. I love that. That's his heartbeat. He never condemns us. And he says, go. Don't do that anymore. Don't do that anymore. Sin no more. Let my compassion and mercy be the thing that leads and guides you. And, and when, when you're in need, remember that, that I have all that you need. And he sends her on her way. And in the very next verse, he has this confrontation with, with religious leaders where he proclaims himself to be the light of the world. John 8, verse 20. Jesus says this. He spoke once more to the people. And he said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they replied, you're making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I make them about myself for I know where I came from and where I'm going. I love having a confident Savior. I'd much rather have a confident Savior than a, than a sheepish one. But you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I'm not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I'm one witness, and my father who sent me is the other. Boom. Where's your father, they asked. Jesus answered, since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my father is. If you knew me, you'd also know my father. 
Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as the treasury. But he was not arrested because his time had not yet come. I'm the light of the world, he says. You see, what he's doing there is he's connecting with Israel's deliverance from Egypt into the promised land. The, the journey they had where, where they followed this pillar of fire. When he called himself the light of the world, they immediately knew that he was connecting to that pillar of fire that, they, that their people had followed. And, and even his timing was unique here. You see, it was during the Feast of, of the Tabernacles that he said this. It's when they're, they're celebrating that same deliverance by having all these bright lights displayed everywhere. It's kind of like our 4th of July with fireworks. And so when he says all this, he's connecting with their history, but he's also connecting with their, their celebration in the moment. And he's saying, I'm the better light. That pillar of fire was awesome. I'm better. The, the lights you display and celebrate with, that's awesome to remember. I will always be there. I'm better. I'm the true light. Followers of mine never walk in darkness. We only ever get the light that leads to life. So Jesus makes a bold claim here. And he connects with these people and their heritage. His boldness stands out. Because there will be times when you're called to be bold for Christ. Sometimes we're called just to be humble and, 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 and loving and, and maybe serving and gracious and behind the scenes. And sometimes you're going to have to stand. If you go to college anywhere in America, I'm guessing you got to stand. And you got to be bold. Not mean. Not a jerk, but where boldness stands out. Jesus knew who he was. He knew he could vanquish darkness. He knew people could be eternally saved and set free just by believing in him. So with this loving yet confident Jesus, who calls himself the light that leads to life, that, that same light that, that John refers to in our main passage we read today, what's the very best way to both obey his commands, 1 John 2, 2 and 3, and stand out. I'll tell you the easiest way. As I read scripture and I study and I, and I live my life and I watch other people live their life in, in good ways and in, in struggling ways, the best way to, to both obey his commands and stand out comes from Jesus himself when he talks about the two greats. The great commandment and the Great Commission. Those marry each other that in such a way that if we can do those on a routine basis, we will live bold, standing out, light and darkness lives more than probably almost anyone on the planet. The Great Commandment comes from Matthew 22. Love God, love people. That's the basics of it. The Great Commission comes from Matthew 28. Be everyday missionaries in whatever you're doing, in word or in deed, out these doors across the globe. Be missionaries. So we take this to heart at Hill Country Fellowship. We take it seriously. And we even have three opportunities right in front of us right now, this very week, throughout this month, throughout... Uh, th throughout the, the beginning of fall to see all of this happen for us. Mission Hill Country, it's happening this week. In fact, you go right out these doors and, and, and just take a, a slight little right and you're going to run right into the, the, the place where you can sign up for Mission Hill Country. From Bertram all the way through Burnett, all the way down to Granite Shoals, we're going to love our community around us. Tangibly, going to retirement homes, going to jail, going to prison going to the Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, beautifying people's houses when they just can't take care of them, building ramps, serving and sweating. But by the way, I know it's 184 degrees today, but it's going to be like only 89 when we started on Thursday. I mean, come on. It'll be like Christmas. You won't sweat. You know you won't. And if you do, we'll just have Sean, you know, wave a fan for you. But it's your opportunity and my opportunity to literally do missions this week in our own home, the Hill Country. Stuff the bus. 
This bold desire to fill a school bus with school supplies for kids that can't get them themselves, that can't afford them or can't afford all of them or are struggling, their families are hurting, they're going to have to buy school supplies, they're going to give up on something over here. And we have the ability to, to, to take care of every need for all the kids in the area as they go to school and then maybe have enough if we stuff a full bus for when kids move in or they lose them or, or something happens to them along the way and they can give them more. Amen. And the schools here come to rely on us and that's a good thing. If, if someone's going to rely on someone, I want the, the one that, needs, that, that is being relied on to know Jesus. Yes. So I'm glad that we're relied on. I'm glad that they look at us and they expect it from us. Not because we owe it to them, but we really owe it to Jesus to be that for them. The Dubai missions trip is happening in November. We have a meeting today after second service right over there in the ALS rooms to literally take Jesus via your own story and go to Dubai where, where there's probably more nations represented in, in Dubai itself than any other city in the world. And, and you take Jesus to them and you just have spiritual conversations and, and you connect with them and you have coffee or, or you drink a, a Coke or maybe a Diet Coke with someone and, and you just tell your story and you talk about Jesus. Yeah, in a dark, dark place, your light stands out. And in one or all of these, you can take active part in where, where you get to give your life away in serving and ministering, sharing the the truth and love of Jesus, being generous with your time and your energy and your finances. And whatever you do, whatever you give, whatever you take part in, it makes you an everyday missionary. You see, we get to literally stand out by fulfilling both of the greats that Jesus tells us. Because we love God, we get to go and love people and then be missionaries as we do it. Both of those can happen. Can you imagine just Thursday, Friday, and Saturday being a part of Mission Hill Country? You could fulfill the Great Commandment and the Great Commission at the same time. That's pretty cool. And you just live out of that. So as you, as you leave the service today, sign up for Mission Hill Country, and Sean or Jeremy will give you a call. Grab a school supply list and, and see what to get at Walmart or, or at HEB or just buy it online at Target and have it delivered to your door and then deliver it to ours. Attend the Dubai mission trip meeting. You see, our goal is that we would live in such a way that every single thing we do, it shows love in some form or fashion. That's what the heartbeat of let love lead is. That's the heartbeat of it. That everything we do has love driving it, love leading it, and that when we're not on scene anymore, love is left there. That's, good. That's what 2017 is all about. It's really what a life of Christ is all about. It's just that we're making it an anthem this year. As we let love lead, we want to do something tangible, something eternal, something that blesses. And you know what happens when you, when you love selflessly, when you give sacrificially, when you, when you sweat in, in, in cleaning up someone's yard or building a ramp, God blesses you in different ways because he's so intimately involved in your life. He's going to bless your life. He's going to bless you and pour out his favor upon you. Is there anyone better to have favor poured out from than God? No, there isn't. Just by giving your life away. Yeah, it might take eight days of your life, of your vacation time to go to Dubai, it, it, it might cost some money to, to raise and to, and to save up and, 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 to, and, and to spend to get over there. But it's a godless place. In fact, they're, they're following so many false gods. And when you go there and, and 20 or 30 or 75 people come to know Jesus and get baptized, wow. What a, what a blessing for the kingdom. But of course God's going to love you and bless you for doing that. So our goal is that, that no matter what we're doing, that it all has love at the core and that it's led by love. And because of that, we will stand out. 
You just will. Because this world is selfish and dark and hurting. So, so it never does anything selfless. It always hoards for itself. So when you freely give, you stand out. You're just different. They're like, what's going on? Is there a hook? Everybody's going to think there's a hook. I, I bet you we're going to have some funny stories at the end of Mission Hill Country. People are like, why, why, why are you really doing this? I mean, last year we were fixing up that one house. We had some people like come outside and put chairs out and just be like, mm-hmm. Going to see why they're putting that new window on over there. And they sat there drinking their coffee in 1,000 degrees. But, uh, and then by the end, they were like, I love that y'all are here. They came out skeptical because the world is skeptical. But they were changed because generous giving people were transforming a house for someone who couldn't do it. And we get to be everyday missionaries. You stand out. The light of the world in you, in the midst of a dark place around you. That's good news. You ask any uh, captain on, on, on the sea, any, any fisherman that, that's come in at night, any, anybody uh, in, in the midst of a storm on the ocean, what they love to see the most, a lighthouse. Amen. That lighthouse tells them where to go, where not to go, how, how to get to somewhere safe. It, it shows in the midst of storms of life, the place that will draw them to, to safety and security and peace were lighthouses. That's what Peter tells us. That's what John tells us. That's what Jesus did. That's what Elijah was. It's the story of the gospel, the full story of Jesus Christ in this book. And we're going to live it out. Now, as, we, as, as I close today, I, I, I want us to, to partake in communion and one of the coolest things about communion, in my opinion, is that, that Paul tells us every time we take it, we proclaim the death of Jesus, which we know was his victory and, as followers, our victory. We, we get to partake in remembering the ultimate standout moment in history. And that's a beautiful thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and uh, and. and, and and ask you to prepare your heart for communion. Maybe you just need to make something right with Jesus. If you're a believer in Jesus, communion is for you. If you, if you. if you just made a decision to follow Jesus, communion is for you. If you're visiting, this isn't your home church, but you follow Jesus, communion is for you. And what, what, what Jesus asks us to do is just prepare our hearts. Make anything right we need to make right with him before we go into communion. And so I'm going to pray for that, and then, uh, and then they're going to hand out the elements after I, after I say amen, and you can stay seated, and then, and then Ben's going to, going to lead us into taking communion together. So they're going to hand out the, the, the bread and the cup together, and then we're going to hold those, and then, and then Ben will lead us in that. So let's go to, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I, I thank you for your written word that, that just over and over and over tells us that we are the light of the world shows us that we are the light of the world and that Jesus, you showed it the best. And then you, you tell us in Corinthians that, that we're being turned into you, so we get to be that. And so, so I pray that all of us here would respond to whatever it is we need to respond to to, to, to love you, God, as a result, love people, and then live our lives wherever we are, wherever we go as everyday missionaries. And as we turn our attention and our hearts to communion, I thank you for who you are. I pray that, that if there's anything that, that we need to make right in our lives with you, that we would just do that at the beginning of, of this song, as the elements are being handed out, that we'd make that right, and then, and then our attention could be fully focused on remembering what you did for us. So Jesus, thank you for that, that moment on the cross where you gave it all and you bore it all and you took it all for our sake so that we would no longer live in condemnation or shame. Bless us as we turn our hearts and minds to you, Father God, and Spirit, would you speak to us? In your name I pray, amen.